Hello, everyone. Um, today we will be talking about the geography functionality new um, inversion. Today plot. we will be talking. I will start as usual in our Twitch sessions with the marketing page. Here um, we have uh, a collection of examples, some of which uh, I will be evaluating. And uh, the structure of the page is as follows. So we have first a row of examples dedicated to one of our main additions in version 12, which was the function geoimage, which uh, is able to produce uh, maps like the function geographics can do, but it, the result output is an image rather than a graphics object, a geographics object. Then we have a second row of examples dedicated to geo elevation fundamentally and a new function called tide data. Uh, to report uh, tide elevations. And then we have a third row of examples dedicated to um, new additions in the geo projection uh, engine. These uh, will be an example on the new function random geo position. And this will be an example on the function geo antipode, which uh, reports uh, antipode of location. Antipode. So this continues our effort since uh, version 10, already five years ago, when we started uh, the geographics project. Okay, let's go ahead with the examples on GeoImage. So with GeoImage, we can uh, get um, an image of uh, parts of the world at any resolution. So for example, this is an image of the whole world by default, we always get the Mercator projection. We can get an image of an area of the world, like the US, and as it happens in geographics, we can choose the projection we want for that image. So um, this is what we have, the standard view of the US. We can get an image of a much smaller region, like a um, city. In this case, uh, the area around 1.5 miles um, around Hyde Park, uh, Central Park, sorry. And then something we can see here is a slight different result from the image we posted um, a few months ago. This is because the tiles we get are from our external um, tile provider called uh, Digital Globe, and they have changed the uh, rendering of the tiles. So now they look slightly different and um, in general, nicer and with more resolution. But you see, for example, now we have some clouds here, etc. And something we have added also in version 12 is an alternative way of controlling resolution. Um, here we have seen a case in which the uh, automatically your image decides the um, resolution, the zoom level. Here we specify it via a geo range. And again, the zoom level of the image will be automatically decided. Here we do it via a new option called geo resolution. This means that we want an image in which the average distance from pixel to pixel is about one meter. This is the meaning of this thing. This is the average distance from meter to uh, from pixel to pixel, while the geo range controls the radius of a circle. So this distance from here to here is one and a half miles. So that's those are independent parameters. Okay, that was a basic uh, intro to geo image. Let's go with the second example. Here. We will be using geographics to see the difference with your image. With geographics, we can get also a map of uh, of the area, but the main difference is that we can have on top of it polygons, primitives like polygons, lines, points, etc. So here we have a polygon of the Vatican City superimposed on a map of the area. If what we want is a satellite 
map, which is the default in GeoImage, what we do is that we have to specify that we want the geo background being satellite type. And for example, um, here we are specifying, because this is not automatic in geographics, it is in GeoImage, but not in, in geographics, that we want the tiles to come from the server uh, digitally. Okay, and again, um, something of higher, uh, higher resolution. We have here the um, assume, uh, assumed uh, image around uh, Saint Peter. This example shows um, how to interact with uh, non-trivial or, or non-standard projections. So the example will show a map around the Parthenon, but instead of doing it in the standard projections, namely Mercator or Equirectangular, we will do it in one of the UTM projections. The UTM projections are very useful they divide the world into 60 different zones and you always need to know which is the zone that is most useful for the point you have in mind. So for example, let's start with the uh, Parthenon location and in this case we know the most interesting is uh, UTMC uh, zone 34 by looking at this. So we have the centering, it's always, the, the centering is always latitude zero and uh, longitude 21. So what we need is the zone that is closest to that centering. These zones, because we have 60, they divide the world into 60 wedges of six degrees each. So for example, um, yeah, this is the closest we have. If we went to one more, say some 35, we would get six degrees more. And now we are farther away from the longitude 23.7. So we will use uh, UTM zone 34. Now, what's the location, the coordinates of the Parthenon in the UTM zone 34? So it's this number. These numbers are meters. This means we are, uh, um, this number horizontally in the UTM zone 34, and this number can be understood as the distance to the equator. So, four in meters, so 4,200 kilometers from the equator. Okay, so now we can have a map like this in which we um, will have points, red, large points on the uh, buildings uh, of the Acropolis area. And we are specifying the projected coordinates in meters in the UTM zone 34, because that's the projection we are using here. So we will choose numbers that are around these two. This, and then this is just um, type setting, so uh, styling. So we will use a satellite background, we'll have a frame, we will be using Digital globe again, remember that we have to specify it for geographics, and we will be adding geogrid lines. Okay, so let's do this. So the system has downloaded the, the tiles in the equirectangular projection, and it's now projecting them to the uh, UTM 34 zone. So note, for example, that the grid lines are not horizontal. That's because the these this projection does not correspond exactly with um, it is not a cylindrical projection so so these these lines are are not perfectly horizontal and then we have the red dots at the uh, buildings of the acropolis and as i was saying this is the distance to the equator so this number would go to zero at the equator and this is number in meters Okay. So the UTM zones are very useful. They are used uh, in many um, applications. And for example, the, the military grids are based on these uh, UTM projections. Okay. Now our final uh, example, I'm not going to evaluate this one, 
is about how to control um, in detail form all the um, layout of the images uh, that we get from uh, GeoImage. So for example, in this case, what we do is that we call country data, which will return the list of the 250 or so countries in the world. And we take the largest nine by GDP. So get this result. Okay. So now what we do is that we create a function that is going to return a geo image of um, size 400 times 400. And it's going to uh, pad it with two white pixels. And finally, we will assemble all of them in a three by three grid. And this is what we have. So if, if we hadn't padded here with the two white pixels, these images would be just next to each other. Okay, so those are the images of the uh, nine largest countries by GDP. Good. So that was the row of um, examples dedicated to geographics and geoimage. So now let's go for example to the uh, examples on geo elevation. Geo elevation data is a function that was uh, very much uh, improved in version 12. It gained many new options and it, it can be considered now as powerful as geographics itself. It's just that instead of reporting a map, it reports an array of elevation. So, uh, um, in this case, for example, something new in version 12 is that geo elevation data can take a geo projection uh, option. So this is very useful, for example, to get a, an elevation grid. In this case, we get um, 784 by 784 um, elevation values. And then we can um, plot the data. And you see, because we used the Lambert asymmetric projection, it already uh, appears without going through any geo function as you would see it from above. So that's, that's very useful. Um, for example, let's try, if we hadn't specified a projection, by default in geo elevation data, we get uh, the equirectangular projection and then result uh, would, would be very different. In fact, here, what is doing is that because instead of showing this very, very thin strip, it just extends into the whole world, right? Because yeah, this, this would be too thin. It, it follows the same uh, heuristics as geographics. Okay, um, right, so if you want just the strip thin, let's do geo range padding none. Right? And we get that thing, which is much less clearer, uh, much less clear than, than that. Okay, something else I wanted to mention here is that you see this, perhaps you have noticed already, but now in version 12, we use very much uh, this iconized uh, construction. This is very useful to focus attention on what it matters. So, for example, if I select this part here and go there, iconize selection, you see, this result still wo works, but now we are hiding the parts that uh, we don't want uh, you to focus on. That's very useful. It works for very large constructions like large matrices or whatever, really useful. Okay. Um, this data that we downloaded can be now manipulated with any other function, non-geo function, right? For example, relief plot will produce a result like that. And, um, or for example, this will produce a um, 3D version of the data. And here, let's iconize this as we had it in the in the web page, and note something important 
it is that the conventions for um, array data are different in what uh, list plus 3D wants and what comes out of geo elevation data. And so we need this reverse here. So that's the view of Antarctica. Again, because this is not a geo function, it doesn't have a notion of um, relative distance, vertical and horizontal, so we have to control it manually, and that's why there is this 250 fact factor here. Okay. Next just an example. So we have added elevation, not only for the Earth, we have elevation also for other celestial objects. In this case, uh, we have elevation for the moon. Um, this comes from a recent uh, project by NASA. And um, you notice how we change automatically to a particular color function that um, yes, stresses uh, the, the, the higher elevations uh, with respect to the uh, lower points. Um, this is the um, face of the moon we see. It's very interesting to compare to the face of the moon we don't see, which is much more exposed to uh, collisions. And we get that. It's very interesting. The difference is very interesting between the two faces. Again, as I mentioned, these are the highest areas, these are the lowest areas. Okay, and um, yeah. Let's work a bit more with elevations. So we download again elevations for the whole world, and in this case, I'm using uh, meters, and I'm using this cylindrical equal area projection. I will explain in a moment why I chose that projection. For example, imagine that we now go and represent this uh, data. The Earth looks very flat here, vertically, due to this cylindrical equal area projection. This is useful because we want to have the values of elevation distributed by area to do the following. Imagine that you want to analyze now what's the histogram of elevations. So we get this result. What we see here, this would be sea level, is that most of the values of elevations are actually under sea. And this is the, this is the distribution we have Many of them around 4,000 meters, 5,000 meters, this area. Yes. Something between 3,000 and 6,000 is the most probable area. And then very few places are actually deeper than 6,000. And then we have um, clearly the areas which are just over sea, over the over sea level, and then higher places, which can go much higher. Now, this is the true distribution for Earth. Imagine that we had chosen something like the standard equirectangular projection. Now, we would have obtained the standard view of the world, but the distribution of elevations would look different. And for example, you see how uh, here, this area is overrepresented. This area is due to the uh, Antar Antarctica. And this is an effect of the projection. In this projection, the Antarctica looks larger than it really is in area. Right? And that's why this area is overrepresented. 
So the lesson to learn here is that when you are doing analysis by area, it's very important to use data that is distributed by uh, in an equal area projection. Okay. Uh, it's very interesting also to compare to other celestial bodies. For example, let's do exactly the same thing. We are using also the cylindrical area projection, but for Mars now. To our leaf plot, just to see the data we got. Again, it looks very flattened, vertically. Very flat, sorry, vertically. Now, if we do uh, the histogram uh, of the list of values, we get that. And you see how uh, different this looks from Earth. And even more different, we can do it for the moon. Which give us this result. Now, if we plot the histogram, what we get is just a um, unimodal distribution. Rather than having two, we get just one. So that's a, uh, an interesting comparison of, of how distributions in elevation uh, look due to the history, the geological history of uh, of the planet. We get a question uh, asking about, can you an iconize all the notebook in the menu? And iconize. So you are saying that if we had the notebook with many iconized objects, would you be able to? Uh, hmm. I don't know. Uh, I, good question. I don't know. There may be an option here somewhere that allows you to act on all the iconized objects at the same time. But at the moment, I, I don't know it. Okay, yes. Again, this last example in the row, I will not evaluate. So what this does is using the, our new function type data here. And so what this type data function does is to report values for the various um, tidal uh, modes of, of earth tides. And you have to provide the property you are interested in, in this case is water level, it's this height of, of tide and the date, because of course tides are periodic uh, events. So what we are doing here is constructing um, the, 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 the maps of tides for many of dates, the, the, the list is here. It goes from 1st of January of uh, 2001 to uh, one day more, in intervals of one hour. And uh, yeah, with, with list animate, we can get all these maps and we need all of these to uh, provide styling, etc. And then this shows the, the, for example, let's focus on, on the periodicity here. You see how it goes from blue to, to yellow, uh, representing the oscillations of tides. So that's uh, another new function in version uh, 12. Now let's go to the last row. Uh, this is again another example um, with, with um, more uh, evaluations to perform, so I will not do them. And what this example is showing is the distortion introduced by um, projections. So what it does, it takes all the countries in the world and because by default our 
polygons for the US do not include Alaska, what we do is that for completeness, we add Alaska, the entity Alaska to this list. So this list of countries is going to include the 240 or 50 countries in the world plus Alaska. And then we construct random colors for all of them. We then load their polygons and their positions using entity value as usual. Remember that it's much more uh, interesting, much faster to download entity value of a list of entities rather than calling the list of entity value of each individual entity. The difference is that by using a single entity value of a list, we will go to the server, to the Wolfram Alpha server once and download all the information. While if we perform a list of entity value calls, each one will go separately to the Wolfram Alpha server and download information. And so timings of, of uh, internet communication will be multiplied by 250. Now that we have the positions, what we do is that we project uh, those positions to the Mercato projection. And then um, what we do here is that uh, we construct projections using Lambert Simutal around the center of the uh, country. So, and then we just uh, show simultaneously the Mercator uh, country and the uh, country as it would look in the um, Lambert Asimutal projection. Lambert Asimutal is an equal area projection. And so countries have their proper size, but they are just moved to where the Mercator projection would say they should be. So this is a way of showing how countries like Brazil, you see here, they appear very much as they are in the Mercator projection, right? However, if we go to Russia, we see how the Mercator projection is very much enlarging them. Right? They should appear more or less with this size. This is the real size, and this is how they look. Or for example, in Africa, which is very close to the equator, all the countries look as they are. So uh, Africa is not distorted, or South America is very um, a little distorted. However, if we go to Canada or Greenland or Russia, countries, uh, areas which are very much to the north, they look very distorted. Just for fun, we can do exactly the same thing with the Mercator projection itself. So what this is doing is simply um, keeping the shape, but reducing them to the correct area. And so you see how this map, so here we are keeping the shape and also, sorry, the area and also the shape. This is the correct shape that Russia would have if we look at it from, from above. And this is the Mercator shape, but reduced to the uh, correct area. Yes, we have another comment about the difference between polygon and full polygon. Right, correct. So yes, that's true. We could have started here by uh, downloading full polygons and that would have uh, included Alaska for the US. The difference is that full polygon also downloads lots of other things, typically very small islands, etc. And because this computation involves all polygons, it's already relatively heavy. We didn't want to make it even heavier. But that's also one of the reasons I'm not doing it in, in real time, because it takes some time. Okay. Uh, a new object here, added in version 12, is GeoVector. So, we have always had in the geo framework in the Wolfram language, multiple ways of describing locations. So we have had our main object, geo position, and then it's cousins, uh, geo grid position for projected coordinates, geo, geo position X, Y, Z for the uh, description of locations as 
XYZ coordinates with respect to the center of the world, and you position E and U, which is a way of describing locations from another given location using local coordinates, like uh, E and U stand for East, North, Up. So what we have done in version 12 is introducing a parallel series of objects, but for vectors. So this is an example. So we have now the possibility of saying, okay, uh, give me, uh, well, let's evaluate this. So this is um, saying for the city of Chicago and this date, 1st of January of this year, give me the vector of uh, the wind direction, the, the, the wind vector. So this returns a geovector object, which is saying at this location, we had this vector. And notice how this is using a norm angle uh, representation. So this means the wind was um, had a 20 miles per hour uh, norm, and it was oriented uh, along 170 degrees. Remember that in geo, angles are measured from north clockwise and using degrees. Now, other representations we can change, so like we do with geoposition and geoposition XYZ, we can also say now, okay, change to our um, no, so, uh, D and U uh, representation. So we get now the same location, but notice how the components changed. So this means the east component of this vector is that one, the north component of this vector is this one, because if this is a horizontal vector, we don't have a nap component. If this had had uh, a vertical component, then it would have been shown here as well. So yes, so now you have full freedom to access locations and vector information. And we are planning to use this in lots of places to describe, for example, in the future trajectories of, of flights, uh, of planes, uh, right? And then we would be reporting their, vec their velocity vectors and their acceleration vectors and things like that. So that's going to be very useful. Um, yes. So once we have a geo vector, it's very easy to plot it. So we just put the geo vector, GV. And here, as a second argument, we specify the uh, type of representation we want. So in this case, we are saying, oh, I want a dart and a circle. And you see, we get both things. If we, if we just say uh, dart, yeah but we just get the dot and the 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 norm of course the the sizes here in this map are related to distances so the size of the arrow are not uh meaningful by by, by themselves unless we have many of these vectors and then of course comparatively you will understand which ones are larger which ones are smaller um, but the direction is meaningful and you see this 170 degrees is this angle from north at that point to that to there. Right? Okay. Uh, another advantage of using geo vectors is that if you project them, they are going to be automatically uh, oriented. So, for example, here because the uh, meridians are being distorted. You see how the orientation of the of the vector gets distorted too, right? but it's pointing correctly south at the location of uh, of Chicago. And again, scale is fully uh, independent for director uh, for uh, distances and for vectors. You can control it. Here we say uh, I can multiply this by three, and then I get a much larger uh, geo vector. Now, another new function in version 12, random geo position. So this is a way of constructing positions on the world or any region you want. For example, we can say, oh, give me 
uh, let's say here, use control equal, the, the US, so we, we get, uh, right, a function geopositions in the US. Now we can go and say, oh, give me a map of that. So we say geographics of point of those geolocations. And we get the geolocations, geopositions mapped here. Remember, you, you have to use point because if you don't use point, by default, geographics is only paying attention to the area. So it knows it has to draw a map of that area, but it will not draw the points. So you have to, in order to get a representation, you have to add the primitive you want. Now, the thing this example tries to show is the importance of the projection. Again, it's, this is basically the same issue we were discussing before for the elevations. So here, I'm going to choose uh, a collection of geoprojection, all of which are equal area. And so we are doing the same thing we were doing before. You see, geographics of points of PS, where these are points distributed throughout the whole world. And we are choosing projections that are all uh, equal area. You see how the points are properly distributed. Now, imagine that we chose projections that are not equal area. And these are all not equal area for different reasons. So now, if we do this, what we get are maps in which the very same points, we are using the exactly same PS, are not equally distributed or um, uniformly distributed. For example, the Mercato projection is enlarging very much the areas around the poles, and you see how the points become very sparse around the poles. That's because the map itself is, is being stretched around the poles. Or here we have some Mercator, but transverse. And so you see, rather than having the points accumulated around the horizon, uh, the equator, sorry, they accumulate around the vertical line. Or, um, for example, in the orthographic project, the orthographic projection is stretching the central area. It acts as a lens around this area. And so you see how the points become more sparse. Or the conformal projections stretch uh, things toward infinity, and so you see how the points get all accumulated in this area, and then very sparse in this area, so here, when we go to, towards infinity. So the lesson here, again, is that when you are doing things in, uh, in which distribution by area is very important, you should always specify the uh, correct uh, projection. Then how do we do this? Well, random geoposition has a geoprojection argument. So what we have to do is to say, for example, let's take Mercator. So we want a thousand points, but distributed uniformly. And you see how they already are starting to accumulate around the poles. So now if we do the same thing, geographics of point PS, uh, geoprojection Mercator, now the points do look uniformly distributed. Of course, if we do it uh, now in an equal area projection, like Lambert Simeter, now they don't look uniformly distributed. Right? They accumulate around the poles and see the funny effect of this hole because the, the Mercator projection is actually not showing all the world. It's cutting at 85 degrees and minus 85 degrees. So the use of a projection or another is always very important. Question is, can you ask for random positions only inland all over the world? Interesting, let's see. So we have a polygon, which is, let me think. So we have an entity, which is the geographic region of the world. So this entity, yes, so let me see if this works. Random geo, random geo position. 
now let's say a thousand. This because this is a very large polygon having lots of um, smaller islands. This is going to take some time. Well, it seems it did it. Uh, let's try to plot that. Geographics point of that thing. Yep, did it. And again, notice how the points are more sparse here because random geoposition by default is always trying to um, return things distributed by area properly. So, yeah. so let's try to do this in Lambda Simple. I think it would look nicer. Uh, geo projection, Lambda Simuta, and I want 53. Is looking at. Okay. Um, I think we are almost done. One more example. Flip the world. So, what do we have here is a new function called geo antipode. And for example, imagine that we say, where are we? And uh, it seems not to be working today. This connects to external servers to find our location via uh, IP address. So let's take a close point to where we are. Say the position um, 40 minus 90. Yeah. Now we do geo antipode of that. And this, what it does is simply it flips. Um, the, well, let me use a different point to make it clear. And just the sign of um, latitude, and then it adds 180 to the uh, longitudes. Yes, there is a comment saying that I could use your dollar your location, but the truth is that, uh, sorry, dollar your position. The truth is that here and dollar your position are the very same thing. Sorry, dollar geo location. They are the very same thing. When, when one doesn't work, the other doesn't either. They, they are the very same thing. Uh, yes, so we were commenting on geo position and um, sorry, on, on geo antipode. So geo antipode is able to compute the antipode location for a geo position object and also for uh, polygons. And so that's the example we have here. So here we are, oh, so this is precisely the polygon we were computing just a moment ago, the polygon of the whole world. And now what we do is that we are going to show in red the geo antipode of the polygon of the world. And uh, this, is, this is superimposed on the polygon of the world itself, which is uh, included in, in the background image. And so this allows us to check which is the point which is uh, antipodal to us. For example, I'm here in, in Champagne, Illinois. So we see that it goes um, like here and this falls uh, on the Indic Ocean. Uh, for example, we, you see how New Zealand falls on top of Spain. You can see it this way or you can see that's it. Um, yeah, Spain is also here. Okay. And yeah, so this is a way to, to compare one side to the other side. And for example, again, we can do this with all the projections. So let's do this for Antarctica. And now let's do the same, the very same thing. So we just draw the geo antipode. Uh, anti, the geo antipodal polygon of Antarctica in red. And so we get this. This, this is an, also a way of comparing sizes of the southern polar area and the northern polar area. Okay. 
Well, that concludes the collection of examples we prepared for the marketing page of uh, Geo functionality. And uh, yeah, well, I invite you to play with this functionality. We are already working on the new extensions of the Geo framework that will appear in version 12.1 soon. And yeah, what can I say? Uh, we are introducing the uh, new connections between the Geo and the regions functionality. We are working on uh, new Geo protocols to be able to download more Geo data. And as a global direction for the future, we are trying to make our maps being more vector-based rather than being uh, fundamentally image-based as, as, as you have seen here. So that will allow us to um, uh, play with, with individual parts of the map and, and labels and things like that more freely, which is going to be really good. Okay, uh, there were some questions during the the Twitch. If there are more questions, I will wait for a few more minutes. All these examples are available in this page, uh, wolfram.com, language 12 new and geography. No more questions, then uh, I think we will stop here. If you have any comment or question, uh, then please contact us. And thank you for attending. And thank you for your interest in the geofunctionality and the Buffum language.